Can you can have your uh, attention, please. So we just got an introduction from uh, Jared, and uh, let's let's continue on these uh, on these smart contracts. So my name is uh, Joris Bontje. I'm a, a software engineer by trade. I've been uh, working at uh, anti-fraud and anti-money money laundering software at uh, financial institutions for a couple of years. Uh, after that, I got interested in big data, uh, big data analytics, and, and setting up Hadoop clusters at uh, Booking.com, Ball.com, Sonoma, Elsevier, a couple of banks as well. But as a hobby project, I was working with, with Bitcoin. I got into it in uh, 2010. And I thought it was very, uh, very interesting. I got got some bitcoins myself. Uh, and my real, I think the challenge was how can we make, how can we introduce big bitcoin to the to the to the common people? How can we make it more user friendly? So what I did to get a bit a colleague in Amsterdam, we started on uh, on Pikapay. And with Pikapay, you can send bitcoins to anybody that has a Twitter account. So that's my day job. And of course, that's not challenging enough already. So now I'm looking into Ethereum and what are the, the possibilities for, uh, for for that. So yeah, we got an introduction about about smart contracts. So what, what can you actually do? We heard uh, a lot of financial instruments on top of Ethereum. You can make a, a, a domain name system like Namecoin on top of it. So what 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 can you what can you do? These are just a couple initial thoughts. I think the sky is the limit. But just let's take you through a couple steps that are already outlined in the Ethereum white paper. So, who, has, who here has read the, the Ethereum white paper from uh, Vitalik? Okay, pretty good, 50%. And who here can do some, some level of software development or can, can call himself a programmer? Okay, okay, okay. So not, not many people will run away screamingly, hopefully. So, as Jared was saying, so one of the first examples is just create your own currency on top of it. I mean, we have already seen so many altcoins, but everybody has to bootstrap their own economy, start mining, start releasing the software, etc. So there's so much, uh, also a big lack of security within the vault because everybody is vulnerable again for this 51% attack. So what if we could just all use the same infrastructure on top of Ethereum and then create our own doggy coin, catty coin, whatever coin on, on top of it. So these are just, Funny examples, but of course you can think of uh, loyalty programs or some in internal communi community uh, award program or some kind of intra-company bounty thing you can, can uh, build on top of it. So this is all possible with uh, with Ethereum. Uh, financial derivatives, so future contracts, options, hedge contracts, swaps, all these kinds of financial contracts you can build it on top of Ethereum, and also with with use of the ether uh, the, the ether currency that is part of <laughs> Ethereum, you have this uh, financial institute uh, directly available as well. So now quite common is that people actually, they lose their, their Bitcoin wallets. So they lose their private keys or they, they, they throw away their laptop and then they, they forget about it. And then when Bitcoin becomes a bit more uh, valuable over time, they remember their loss <coughs> or they trust it with some kind of French guy in Japan and, and they get screwed <laughs> that way. So, so all, these, all these risks, Maybe we can mitigate that with some kind of bank function on top of Ethereum, but that allows you to, um, in case you lose your private key, you can still go to this party, but they are limited in what they can do. So maybe it takes for them half a year to withdraw your money, but you can still withdraw your money that way. And if you don't trust them, you can initially uh, instantly withdraw it yourself. Or maybe you can trust your private keys with multiple entities like uh, a notaris and uh, maybe your maybe your spouse or something like that. So all this structure, it's already possible with Bitcoin with this multi-sig thing, uh, but it's it's difficult to do, uh, and a lot of the infrastructure is is it's very hard to integrate. And with, I think with Ethereum, this is a lot easier to craft your own contracts that would fulfill the, the need for this. Um, yeah, data storage, uh, Dropbox. We all trust these these central organizations. Um, yeah, what's going to happen with it, and, and how, uh, how do I know for sure that in, in not only in two years or five years, but in 10 years, 20 years, I still have access to my, my valuable data. So with Ethereum, you can come up with self-enforcing contracts that will check every day that there's still a copy available of your, of your data. And if not, it will internally raise some kind of bounty program for all these third parties to, to make provable copies of your, of your data itself. So you can you could, can do this as well. Uh, we have name registration. So 
if you want to do a registered domain name, you have to go to uh, well, the Dutch domain name registration agency or GoDaddy or some of these ICANN affiliates. There are all these problems with this. I mean, there's this organization, but if you don't agree with them, where do you go? So again, with Ethereum, you can come up with your own name coin clone, you can come up with your own domain and registration service, but using all the infrastructure and all the security and all the utilities that, uh, that Ethereum offers to you. So these are pretty, pretty simple things, but combining all these things together and putting in all kinds of voting mechanism, proof of work, uh, self-modifying code, you can actually start building organizations on top of it. So instead of having a, a non-profit organization and going to the to the Kamer von Kophandel and, and just registering it there and going to a notary and just giving them all your paperwork and just then hopefully something something happens okay with your with your organization, you can enforce this into into code itself. So all these administrative parts of running a company, of running an organization, like um, collecting membership fees, voting for changes of the, the laws itself. Uh, what are you going to do with dividend payouts, all these kind of things. Instead of just having them on, on paper and just proof, trust everybody to use it, you can enforce this in code and have it be executed automatically on top of this uh, Ethereum uh, blockchain. Sounds, sounds all very fancy, but let's see how we can actually do this. So a couple important properties of Ethereum. These are just taken from the, from the white paper. Um, so these, these contracts that you write, it's, it's code, it's binary code, and it lives on top of the Ethereum blockchain. And just for simplicity's sake, let's say you can compare the Ethereum blockchain with the, the Bitcoin blockchain, with just some different properties. And you can ask Jeffrey about all the, the differences uh, later on. Um, so each contract, once it is published on the blockchain, it just lives there in isolation or and in its own. So it has its own identity, it has, has its own address, so you can send payments, you can send transactions to a contract. It has its own account balance, so it can actually send funds to, to other parties. It can offer bounties for uh, predator drones to enforce your contracts. It can do whatever you pro tell it to do via the, 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 the built-in programming language. But the only thing that these contracts can do, they don't have a lot of outside interaction. They can just inspect the state of the blockchain. They can look at their own contract storage, they have some read-only access to other storage locations, other contracts, and they can, well, receive transactions and send out transactions. But they cannot make phone calls, they cannot directly control uh, websites or some kind of third-party thing, because um, it, it, they're very limited. So you need, to, you need to trigger these contracts somehow, and you need to, well, uh, read out their state, or you need to inspect their state uh, after they, they have been executed. And you activate a contract by sending a transaction to it. So each transaction that is sent to a contract, it triggers the execution of the contract, it runs through all these computational steps, and it updates, updates both its internal state and possibly it sends out external transactions again. So it's quite limited, but if you can build something within this um, isolated, isolated uh, uh, functionality, it becomes quite powerful. But this is just very low level. So most likely you yourself, I mean, unless you're a contract developer, you won't be directly interacting with these contracts yourself. So there will be all these kind of user-friendly uh, user interface on top of it, third-party websites that will monitoring the state, sending transactions with it, uh, transferring and keeping it up to date, uh, allowing you to download uh, all kinds of uh, layouts on top of it. So this is just very low level, but pretty powerful. This programming language on top of the Ethereum blockchain, it's, it's too incomplete. And that's just a fancy way of saying basically you can do anything you want with, with this language that you can also do with other programming languages. So it might take a couple more steps to uh, compute, make some kind of computation, but you all kinds of uh, cryptographic primitives you can calculate with it, all kinds of you can make your own chess program on top of it. Basically, anything you can you can do on top of it, and you can re replace one programming language with whatever other abstraction that's available. Just we'll just be seeing a couple of the programming languages that are currently available, but this is just what's available right now. And maybe in a couple of years or in a couple couple of weeks, who knows how fast it will go? Uh, 
uh, something else will be available. But all these other languages, they can all be translated and replaced and be uh, executed on top of this, of this same uh, platform. So how do we know that it won't be abused for spam? Or somebody is clever and they just do a, like a 10 go to 10 infinite loop and just make all these miners crash. So once a contract is executed, every step that it takes, every CPU cycle on this Ethereum virtual machine, it, it has a little cost. So with the transaction that you use to trigger the, the code execution, it is used, the, 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 the fee, the value that you send with it, it's used to basically pay for the execution of the contract itself. So if you have a very simple contract, it might be very cheap to run it. And if you have a very complex organization, it might be more complex to, to run. But hopefully over time, um, the, the, the fees and the cost of all the miners running these contracts, will, will, it will pay for them for themselves. And it will be uh, financially interesting to run your own Ethereum node and just collect the fees of all these contracts that are running on top of it. So a lot of these, just the regular steps, they, they have a well, normal cost associated, but some, some things like creating another contract or sending an external transaction or updating the storage, they have a higher cost associated with it. So it might be getting quite complex how, how much it will cost to, to run your contract. So the, right now in the white paper, there are a couple proposals of what this cost structure might look like, but I think this will change over time based on actual insights of actual people running contracts on top of Ethereum and seeing how miners will pick it up and if our current storage possibilities with hard drives, if they, they, uh, they, can, they can use this. Also mentioned this, these contracts, they have their own storage space. So they have two to the power 256, basically memory locations where you can store data. And, and this is a lot, but you pay for every byte that you store in this, in this, uh, in this blockchain. How much gigabyte is that? It's like way beyond, right? It's, 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 so it's a lot. It's a lot. Yes. Yes. No, it's, it's basically, uh, it's, uh, no, it's not infinite, but uh, like infinite minus one uh, almost. No, no, it's, it's, it's you quite. Need, <laughs> you need a lot of money. What's the reason for that? I mean, if it's infinite, what, what, what's the sense of it? So basically, I mean, there have been some questions like, well, why do you use 256 bytes? Uh, bit bit indexes, why don't you use 64 bit or something like that? Basically say, well, we don't want to have this 640 kilobytes is enough for everybody limitation. So just like, just like, just put something, do something crazy and be sure that this will work for the next couple, couple years. But if you can't implement it. <laughs> <laughs> hmm? I mean, if you, okay, so basically it's probably So you won't, so you won't use every location, but you can use any kind of hash function and just basically pick some kind of random location in there. And because the, the total domain of storage is so immensely uh, huge, you all, you're almost guaranteed that this location is free. So that might be, make it very easy and very straightforward to implement some kind of storage facility on top of it. I mean, from two, two of your points of view, I understand the point. But mm -hmm. if you say, okay, this is infinite, you give something, you give it with a protocol or a jury, yeah. Yeah. No, but, but remember, for every for every step, you're still paying. So your your limitation is not the the memory space, but actually the fee that you have to pay for every step, for every memory location that is that uh, that needs to be changed. It's going to be very complicated. <laughs> Sorry. Not to design for the future. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, so it's a forecast, yeah. Yeah. And the fee means actual money. Well, it's it's Euro? ether. It's this entire new currency on top of Ethereum itself. So it, Ethereum comes with its own currency, uh, Ether, and yeah, it, it, it hasn't really been issued yet, so we don't know what it will be worth. Uh, but think of it, it's something like, like Bitcoins, so some kind of this decentralized, decentralized uh, distributed currency that you can buy and sell and mine, and basically you use it to run these contracts. So it's not really there to replace Bitcoin or any of these other currencies, but it's more, well, as they say, it's the oil of this of this, this machine. So you, you have to pay this currency to make these contracts execute. It's also the business model of Ethereum. That's how you make money. Well, you, you, can, you can also send either to someone else. So, for example, if I want to send you some money, I just send you money, as in how we do it in Bitcoin. So you give me an address, I send you Ether to your address. That's it. But it can be for your cost. Oh, yeah. Organization. Oh, yeah. Charge. No, my, my organization. No, no. Well, I, theory. No, I mean, if, if I was if I were a miner, I would get either for that. 
So um, if I mine a block or whatever, so I would get here for that. So say, for example, I would get 10 meters for every block that I mine. If I would like to pay you for whatever service that you offer me, I would say like that. I just send you, I just send you Ether. That's it. So as, as how does it normally go in, in, in Bitcoin? That's how it works in Ethereum as well. Let, let's leave the IPO questions for when I'm way, way, way in the back and have a lot of yeah. beer. Yeah, the Q&A with the exactly. The end, so, so okay. actually one of the most cool and frightening things is that these <laughs> contracts, <coughs> the byte code for these contracts, they live on the storage space itself. So contracts can modify their own code. So that doesn't mean that they well not yet that they become self-aware and start to improve it, but actually you can, if you change your mind, if you have some kind of bug, and hopefully the bug isn't that big enough that you broke the self-update part of the code, but you can have, you can update the rules of your organization based on the majority vote. So this is very, very powerful, but if you make a mistake with it, you can ruin a contract and it just will be sitting there forever, dead and, and not being able to update. So having good developers and having good tools to test it becomes very, very important. <laughs> So in the end you're saying this this will create a singularity that will kill everybody. <laughs> Not like the Skynet, but I mean <laughs> let's 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 see. Oh, you, you have Skynet. heard about autonomous organizations yet. Yeah. So really really on the on the lowest level there's this Ether script and it's like a assembly language where you can access the stack and push values on top of it and make a transaction and do all kinds of uh, binary and arithmetic operations. Uh, I think probably nobody should be really be, be, uh, be required to understand this except if you're programming your own uh, Ethereum client. But this is basically what every language that you'll build it will be compiling down to this. So this is the same. I mean, if you have a, if you're running Java code, it will also compile to Java bytecode. Or if you have a, a Windows uh, exe file, in, the, in internally it will also look like this. So this is just the the the, the machine language of Ethereum. Uh, right now, this version one is well released and described in the white paper, and that's also more or less what is implemented with the, the C++ and the, and the Go clients. There's also discussion of a version two, which has some drastic modifications. I yet, I'm, I'm very interested to hear about it. We yet have to see if that will be the next target version of this, maybe it's a version three in the in the working. But basically, that doesn't matter. You don't need to worry about it. What you need to worry about are these slightly higher language abstractions on top of it. So there's this C-like programming language, CLL. Actually, it's more Python-like, uh, I would say. Uh, so, so here you have the name coin, uh, algorithm implemented in three lines of code that it looks like pseudo code it looks like python code and if you if you know javascript or visual basic or whatever probably you can with, with a little bit of effort you can understand what's happening here now i'll just explain it what actually is happening here in a couple steps so this is one of these language abstractions that are currently available and it's currently in a compiler but you can enter this kind of cll code and it will compile it and it will return this and this you can copy paste into a <laughs> into the Ethereum client and create your own uh, contract. There's another language and there's a, a Lisp-like language. So LLL. So already I wonder why are there already two higher level languages, but this is a bit easier to parse from a developer point of view and maybe some of the academic types that like Clojure and Lisp and Haskell, etc. they really feel warm and fuzzy with this and all this, I don't know, Python stuff, they, they, they are too, I don't know. So uh, <laughs> this isn't really doing the same kind of thing, but um, uh, again, there are two high level languages that you can understand. So if you know JavaScript or Python or Clojure or any of these kind of high level languages, it shouldn't be too difficult to pick up and to start writing your own, your own contracts. Just a little bit of syntax difference. And of course, this, this virtual machine in which you're operating and you're limited to whatever is possible in this, in this virtual machine. So let's look at the actual contracts. 
I mean, I won't go into too much of a detail here, but this is a, like a 15 line altcoin. So you can implement Amsterdam coin with, with, this, with this software. So this software, you, once you upload it into the Ethereum blockchain, it will sit there and each time you trigger it by sending a transaction to it, it will execute this step by step, sm slowly eating the fee that, you, that, that it takes to, to execute this. It will update its internal state and actually it doesn't do any kind of outside activity besides that. So first of all, it checks if the value that you sent to it, if the, the, the transaction that you triggered with, if it is high enough. If it's not high enough, you don't want to have it partially execute the code and just stop and, and just be out of funds somewhere in the middle of your code. So you want to have it abort at as soon as as soon as possible. So that's what this, this first uh, precondition check is, is all about. Then the next thing is the first time the code is executed, actually it will run these last two lines. So it checks this contract memory location or this contract storage location thousand where 1,000, it's, it's really an arbitrary number. It could have been 2,000 or 10,000 or, or 999. It just checks if this storage location is, is initialized or not. So the first time it's executed, this memory location is not yet initialized. So it will actually run only these two lines of code. What it does, it will modify the storage location of this creator variable and this this is just the the, the, the person uh, probably you you created this contract so you will be replacing this with your public key of your ethereum wallet and it will assign you 10 to the to the power 18 tokens points whatever you call beer beer points whatever you call your currency and you'll be very filthy rich within this domain of your own contract and it will update this storage location thousand just to tell it it's initialized and it will never ever execute this initialization thing uh, anymore. Once this is done, for every fu future transaction that is sent to it, it will run again, it will check that you send enough money to it, and now it will just only execute these lines 4 to 12. It will look, what's the address of the sender? So, first time, I mean, only you just create the currency, uh, you're the only rich person within your magic world of your, your, your beer tokens, so you want to send it to, to your, your neighbor over there. So it takes your address. You need to pass it a couple arguments. So you pass it the address of your, of, your, of your buddy over there. You also pass it how many tokens do you want to send to him. You need to check actually that you're not overwriting this, this source code itself. So it's updating its internal state. But you cannot use all the memory location. Because it could be possibly that you just modify accidentally like the first byte in here and then you'll just corrupt your entire contract. So there's a little bit of error checking in here. Also, you cannot send more money than you have in your own storage location. So initially, you cannot send more than 10 to the power of 18 tokens. And afterwards, once you start distributing your wealth and make everybody uh, very, very rich, you don't want them to be able to send more money than they actually have. So once all these checks are done, it just subtracts the value from the sender's location and it adds it to the to the recipient and the contract is done everybody can inspect the the it's, it's it's all on the blockchain so everybody can see what's the current order book how does it look like what's the balance of all these accounts but to make a modification to it you need to send another uh, transaction to it so this is just very simplistic but an example of some kind of currency built on top of uh, on top of ethereum instead of beer points this could also be shares of your company, or maybe uh, euros. Reflect euros in some kind of some kind of wallet, or it can it can be it can be anything. Uh, internet usage tokens, Wi-Fi points. You you can do anything uh, with this. So without going too much into detail, any any questions about this contract example? Yeah, yeah right now. I'm not sure if I if I get it. Sure. If, if we would have a, uh, a smart contract, yeah? mm -hmm. and that's it. That, that contract is in the blockchain. Exactly. So that's Distributed to all uh, of the nodes who yep. are running the <coughs> Ethereum miner, yep. say. Yeah. But at the moment, you, for instance, would send a signal to the blockchain that a certain event has happened that we have uh, uh, negotiated up front. Yep. And I owe you money. If I would just disconnect a total from uh, this whole network so my wallet is not accessible at all, how does that work? So, this entire storage, it's 
I mean, all these miners, it's it's decentralized. All these miners, they have a, have the, basically a copy, the same the same copy. So once this contract is executed, everybody will know the new state of the network, and that's enforced by this this mining algorithm and this award that is that is sent out once executed. So once this once this, this code run goes through, there's nobody to to stop it. But that means that I can have a negative balance in my Bitcoin wallet, for instance, as well. So this is just a. This is just a, a virtual currency on top of it. So on the lowest level, this is the, the Ether currency that's just handled by Ethereum itself. But this is just a awards program that you just implement yourself in five lines of code. So in this currency, it's not possible to go negative, mm -hmm. but you can make a contract that allows you to go negative or that maybe allows you to go negative for three weeks and after three weeks, your account will be disabled. I mean, you can make up whatever rule you can, you can come up with. I believe it's actually executed by all of so, them. So everyone, everyone has a, a, a the entire blockchain on their computer, and whenever someone finds a block, a miner finds a block, it would process the entire transaction, all the transactions that have come in previously. And if if a transaction were sent to a contract, the miner would execute that contract. Now, when it when it executes the contract, the current block updates, so you would get a, a different state. So if if you find a a block. You would broadcast it to the network, and everyone within the network would have to um, rewind um, and then process all the transactions that is within the current block, and they would have to have the same state. If the same state doesn't match, it means that you know the, the block that, that you broadcasted wasn't correct. So that's kind of how it works. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's one huge consensus network. So all these code executions, they are deterministic. They always have the same outcome, whoever runs it, and they will be verifying with each other that this well, consensus so still they have to work. So in, 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 in a way, yes. Okay. But how do you do guarantee the order in which you process things in the same block? It, it's, 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 it's up to the, um, to the miner. So if, if I were to... That's the winning one, because it doesn't have to be consensus if you do... If you implement no, no, no. this currency? If, if I... The, the contract doesn't matter. So, well, that's state, and if you execute two, uh, two almost at the same time, and two different miners execute in a different order, they so that's that's what that's where uncles come in. So, um, if I were to find the block before someone else does, and uh, and another one person broadcasts the block as well, so you have um, one broadcasted at like ten past two, another one eleven past two, the eleven past two becomes um, the uncle, and the uncle gets rewarded as well, but a less amount. And in order to do that, so you have a lot of stale blocks. So if you would, if you would broadcast a stale block onto the network, you get you get rewarded, but within the next cycle, with a li less amount, because you still find a fellow block, but it is not the current block. That's how it works. It, you know, and, and have you read upon the ghost protocol? Okay, well, that's where it comes from. Oh, okay, so that's so fun. Still. Uh, um, what if uh, there's uh, one block uh, and um, you have a, a sub-currency transaction, uh, so uh, an execution of this contract, um, what, one that, uh, that sends from, this, uh, from the same address uh, to person A and from the same address to person B, and there's not enough uh, for both? Um, so well, that's, what, that's entirely thing? up to the contract. I mean, Ethereum only handles the execution of the, the contract, and mm -hmm. whatever is programmed in the contract, it's up to you know, the builder of the contract. So we are not validating anything that is altcoin. Mm -hmm. So I mean, if, if you want to have security checks that you don't double spend, it's up to you. Of course. Um, the, the question is just uh, which one's executed first? Is just uh, the, the one that's um, that's seen first by the oh, yeah. miner. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So if if, if I had, um, you know, it, it depends on how a transaction propagates within the network. Mm -hmm. So um, if if I were in China and uh, someone else would be in in the states and. I were that the country, the miner were in the states as well. It would probably mean that the one that were in the states sent the country. So right, yeah. Okay. You, you so, get the point. so from a technical point of view, this is very interesting. But just from a contract point of view, you don't need to worry about this. This is handled by the platform itself. So you can just worry about your business logic in here, and you can just rely <laughs> on Ethereum itself to to execute this in the right order and with the with the right uh, with the right incentive. Uh, just another small example, the Namecoin uh, contract. So again, we see a 
a similar pattern, we check, did we send enough feed to it? And then apparently here you need to send at least 200 uh, ether uh, fee points, whatever, to it. This contact, only thing it does, it updates an internal state and it keeps uh, a key value pair, so your uh, key value store. So your key might be your domain name or the hash of your domain name or your email address or something like that. And the value, maybe it's the, it's your Ethereum address. So then instead of having to know and, and distribute each other, each, each, uh, the, your Ethereum address to each other, you can just look up by your email address, whatever is your uh, real address based on your email address or based on your domain name or based on whatever key you are using. Oh, so on lines three, it checks, is this address that you provide as first argument to the, to the co contract call, is it already taken? And in this version of the name coin thing, the first come, first serve. So the first one to register its domain will have it forever. So, but you could extend this and make some kind of expiration or you can, if you pay twice the amount, you can outbid the other person or you can come up whatever kind of crazy ICANN rules that you would have dreamed of and implement your own in, in Ethereum. But this is very simplistic. Again, it's a little check. If we are updating our storage, we don't want to have our update to affect the source code itself. So we have a little check to prevent you from making a, uh, uh, an exploit to the to the contract code itself. So if all is, what is, is going fine, it just updates the storage location. So the key is the first argument of the transaction, the value is the second one, and now it's just stored and, and propagated across the Ethereum network. And everybody can look up what is the IP address for this domain name, what is the Ethereum address for this email address, what is your Bitcoin address associated with this, with this Twitter name, whatever you can, you can come up with. Is, is this already uh, running? Or this is already running. So, and this is the LF0, the C++ client. It looks very scary, it is very scary. This is just initial version of what's working right now in the development network. So this is not what will be released in three months or whatever. This is just the current developer geeky slightly better than command line implementation they, they can they came up with. So what, what do they have right here? So actually you can, when, you make, when you're setting a transaction, you can actually type the name and it will actually do a look, look up and see what is the address associated with this name already. It will, for all these contracts, it look for the one contract that's called name rack. So this is just whatever con name contract was coupled with this client. You can have your own client that uses a different contract for this name, uh, name lookup, but this one uses it here. It will execute this little piece of code once you try to register your own name. And then it just updates the storage of this contract and with your address, or the, I think it's using the hash of the whatever text you type there, you can store your Ethereum uh, client in there. So this has been out there since uh, February uh, 14th. I think they already made some, some kind of improvements, but this is just some simple thing you can already do on top of Ethereum. And all this logic of this, this name lookup in your clients, they can just build it on top of Ethereum instead of having some kind of outside layer, out, outside network, DNS system. So it's really becoming quite self-empowering. Uh, and who knows what writing your own contracts and using it will look like in the future. Maybe there will some kind of fancy drag and drop thing that your business analysts and, and lawyers can use themselves. Uh, Iron Man uh, style, uh, whatever, uh, code drop and drop. So I think there will be a lot of boilerplate contracts. So all this source code writing, I think this is for the initial versions and, and, and just to, to get started. But at some point, point there will be a lot of reuse of codes. There will be commonly understood contract templates that you can reuse that everybody has been testing, peer reviewed, and, and that even lawyers understand what the output of is. So this is really interesting what will happen in the future. So don't really worry too much about these ugly uh, web interfaces. Everything is, uh, everything is possible. So we already saw there are quite some bug opportunities already in the code. You could accidentally overwrite its own state if you made the mistake when committing your contract to the blockchain, there's no way to update it unless you write the code <coughs> to self-update. So this is really, really tricky. So proper 
contract simulation and having an understanding of how your contract will run, how much it will cost, and what are all the possible side effects is very, very important. So already there's been some development on this. So this guy, uh, this was presented yesterday in San Francisco on the, one of the Ethereum meetups. So he made a web interface. Actually, let me uh, show that to you. It looks very uh, funky, and it is. So this is basically a simulation of uh, Ethereum. Uh, if you cannot read it, I'll just uh, basically summarize what's there. So to the top left, there are some wallets already with some balance. So this, my wallet has 800 uh, tokens in there. The couple contracts registered already, and I can send a transaction. So there's already this name coin contracts in here. And if you look at it, this is the same name coin code that I just showed you a couple slides earlier. So I can already use this. So this name coin contract, it has this address. And just by sending a transaction to this address, I can register my own key with this contract and have it, have it persisted. So right now, there's only one key value pair. So on key 101, this is the value O high. So let's, uh, let's expand that. So I want to make a transaction. I say, well, from my wallet, I want to send it to the name coin. I send it, uh, what was it, 200. I say 102 is K by. Actually, yeah, that's a big difference. So I can use my, 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 my mobile phone number. And I use, as value, I use my email address. Not sure, actually, if this works. Let's just try it. So I send a transaction. Transaction is sent. I look again, name coin. Too bad, probably it was not recognized. Let's try another one. Do you know who made this? Did you send yeah. The fee, no, I think the fee was not required at this point. Hang on, let me try it. So from to my name coin, fee 100, that can just be 102, and then it is. Now the second transaction. There you go. My transaction was sent. I look here. No, the wrong one. Uh, OK. Let's uh, debug this uh, at another uh, point. <laughs> Still. Anyway, you can imagine how you can use this kind of interfaces, debug things, just to, to experiment what's going on without spending any ether. You can just see how does my contract react under this circumstance. Actually, this guy, he was uh, inspired by my work that I did a couple days earlier. So I also made my own contact simulator without a fancy web interface. This is more like a, a unit testing interface. So I'm simulating the Ethereum nodes. You can upload your own or you can connect your own uh, clients with it. And then you can write all kinds of tests. So here I have some kind of test where I say, what happens if I send not enough money to my contract. What happens? I, and then I, I check that I get that it will be stopped and that the, the stopping message will be insufficient fee. What happens if I create this contract? What happens if Alice pays to Bob? What happens if Bob pays to, pays to Charlie, but he doesn't have enough money? So all these kind of edge cases of your contract you can, you can develop on top of this and just simulate however Ethereum will work. And once you're happy with your contract, you can compile it and you can sub submitted to the actual Ethereum network. So, inspired by this, now you all want to learn how to write your own uh, Ethereum clients, uh, Ethereum contracts. I'll be sharing these links, so you can just look up at the meetup uh, location later on and just copy paste the links from there. You don't need to uh, write them down right now. So very important is the Ethereum white paper. It really outlines whatever is possible with Ethereum, what the language looks like, what are the limits, what are the initial fees. And we don't know if it will be the final version, but basically it is what, have, what we have right now and just uh, use that as a, as a, as a guidance. We're ready these two simulators. So this uh, JavaScript simulator that I just showed you and this more unit test simulator that I wrote myself. Uh, this uh, description of the, the CLL language and also of the, the Lisp-like language, including with, uh, with the tutorial. 
and you can also uh, well read and expand that. And I've been working together with a with a guy that I've never met in uh, in San Francisco. We're working on a on a YouTube uh, channel where we just going through these contracts one step at a time, just explaining all these edge cases. How does it work? What does this mean? Why do you do actually do this? But yesterday we uh, published the first uh, edition explaining the subcurrency contract. This morning we uh, published uh, the the name the name coin example. And I don't know, uh, next week we'll, we'll try to keep it up and just uh, go to a lot of these examples and really step by step introduce you and explain how you can write your own contracts. <coughs> Thank you guys. Thank you. So let's, let's reserve the non-contract related questions to, uh, to, to, to Jeffrey. But uh, yeah, go ahead. I just want to make sure that I understand it right. The only input and output of the contract is the transactions, meaning either you send it. The, the, the transactions that you send to it, which can have arguments. So you can send like an array of values to it mm -hmm. uh, as arguments of the transaction. And it also looks at the, end, the, the current state of the blockchain. So it can look at what are other contracts storing? What is the balance of this other account? But it can, but it cannot make a web call and just do a soap call to Amazon and inspect that. I understand, but it can look at the state of other contracts. Is that yes, the exactly. It has a read-only view on other contracts and inspect their their storage. But the state of one contract is that e to the two fifty-six, right? That is the state of. Well, there's so many there's so many memory I locations. Understand, but yeah. that is the Yes, that's what I did. But the story if you look at another contract state, you would have to know how that contract works. Right? Yeah, so yeah, you need to have some kind of informal API contract between contracts where you tell me, well, if I update my, I don't know, my, my dividend payout, I will always store it at memory location 1 million. And, and yeah. so maybe there will be some kind of meta. abstraction lay, meta layer where contracts where compatible hedging contracts can can communicate with each other on that level but that doesn't exist yet you can be the first one to uh, to define this right so contracts they cannot they cannot smell uh, or they cannot sense whatever the temperature is so if your contract relies on the on a regular currency exchange rate or on the temperature on a stock ticker or some kind of outside thing you actually require data feeds or data feed contracts where there will be some kind of semi-trusted party which will be publishing on a regular interval what they, whatever the temperature is in Amsterdam or whatever the, the Bitcoin exchange rate on Kraken.com is or whatever the, the stock market was doing. So there will be a lot of these data feeds all over the Ethereum uh, blockchain and you can use this as, that as a source for, for your network or for your, for your contracts themselves. And you need to, on one end you need to rely on these uh, on these data feeds, on the other hand, there can be many of them. So maybe instead of using one temperature data feed, you'll be using ten temperature data feeds, and you will be taking the average. And any outliers, you will send your killer drones to 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 take take care that they will be resolved. That means you can do like an HTTP GET or something like that. Or no, so you cannot do an HTTP GET. So somebody else will need to do an HTTP GET, and you can publish the results on the Ethereum thing. So there are some very funky trusted computing <coughs> things that might be possible in <coughs> whoever knows but that really goes beyond whatever is possible so it's maybe it's going to be centralized so if you want to have a, a data feed from someone else someone has to provide it yeah so it's not like you can do an HTTP to something but right. you have to rely on for example me and 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 yours and, and a whole bunch of other people and then you take like a You, you can. It, it is very sandboxed. So you have um, you have the you have the language, and that's it. No, nothing external. How does the blockchain compare, or the, 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 the blockchain of Ethereum compare to the blockchain which is used for Bitcoin? What do you mean compare? Or is, are there other major differences, or for example, the two to the power of two? Oh, yeah, yeah different. There's, there's a lot. There's a, there's. Is this more it doesn't money? compare at all. Um, no, no, not at all, because. You have to, you have transactions, you have contracts, and it it is the contract is a st the the current block has a state which has everything beneath it, as in it has all the contracts. Um, it can execute and uh, reference all the contracts. It can reference every account because 
Ethereum doesn't work with in and outputs. It works with a like a, a ledger. So um, if I were to send something from my account, I would reference my ledger. I would say, I would say like send a ten ether from from my account to someone else's. And it doesn't work with in and outputs. It just said like subtract from mine and add to another. So and everything of that is stored within the blockchain. So if you were to re if you had to replay everything, you would need all the transactions, replay everything to come up with the, the, the current block. That's how it works. So um, if I were to execute a contract and, ex and the contract would execute something within the contract, so it would modify it, it would modify the entire tree. And um, that is how you can compare my tree to someone else's in order to see if I am on the current block, if, I, um, if it's still correct. That's how it works. So it's very different. Well, one of the one of the issues that we have seen in the last couple of months, the last couple of years in Ukraine, was the problem of the stealing of the wallets. So, uh, you know the issues. Yeah. How does Ethereum? Does it so, really have something which actually would prevent that? Because in theory, you can trace it. So Ethereum itself, not, but you can make a contract. So instead of storing all your pension funds within your Ethereum wallets, you would actually store it in some kind of contract. And in, in this contract, there is a withdrawal limit where you can only withdraw 1% a week uh, by, by just calling the contract. So you cannot instantly withdraw it. So even if your keys get stolen, only the, the, the thief can buy, can only get 1% per week out of it. And then you might have some kind of clause where if you have three other parties agree in common if you have some kind of multi-signature thing, they can trigger it and they can instantly remove all the funds from this contract to, to some other kind of thing. So if your wallet gets stolen, you just run to Jeffrey and to me and to, uh, to Jared and you say, well, sorry guys, you need to help me out. We all sign this message for a fee, of course, and then you can, you can, get, you can, you can get your funds out of it and you would only lose 1% one, 1 of your fee. Well, you can't, do you also still have the same issue of the 51% problem? Do you still have it here? Or? Yeah, we do. Yeah. You know, I still, a majority has to agree with, you know, it's like, I mean, it's a consensus network. So, you know, if 51% agrees on something which isn't valid, then it is, becomes valid. Or if the US government decides to have a supercomputer on this. Oh, yeah. Platform, Oh, yeah, absolutely. But it's not, that's not going to happen. Well, it's not going to happen. It's ASIC proof. It is possible. It's ASIC proof. Um, well, Dagger hasn't, I mean, they came up with Dagger. Uh, Vitalik came up with Dagger. Yeah. And um, it still hasn't been decided on what kind of proof of work or right. proof of whatever we're going to use. So we're still using a very simple shine method in order okay. to mine block. There's nothing, nothing set in stone. Right. Um, we, have a, we have a cryptocurrency research group that's going to research, do a lot of research to a lot of proof of work, proof of stake. Is it on the forum or is it? Oh, no, it's not on the forum. Um, oh. We have a um, new Coblet. He, he actually came up with, uh, with the ETC, the whole stability curve. Okay. So, like, the, the original author, he's on our team. He's our um, advisor. Nothing is set in stone. So if you have a brilliant idea, come to us and have a little bit, you know, we'll figure it out. How large is that? So, so hang on, before we go into, so yeah. what's interesting, comparing with other currencies, so right now, if you have Namecoin, you need to have your own blockchain, and every altcoin which adds one magic feature, they need to have their own miner network, and they're only as secure as all these miners com combined. With Ethereum, you can have all these different use cases recite next to each other, and they, they, they leverage, they benefit, from the, the total network security instead of just the network security of one one of these use cases. So, you, but, but your question was, what about this, this group? Uh, how many people are involved in this? Right, the research group. Um, I'm, honestly, I'm, I don't know. Um, I know it is, it, is, it is new and it is Vitalik. I mean, he has this big, big background within all the cryptocurrency stuff. So obviously he is the, the leader, sort of, and um, he, he cooperates with Neil, and Neil has a whole base operation in Barbados. I, I think I know, I, I know two of them, but it's it's pretty large, and they you know they, they do it because they think it's fun. So yeah, <laughs> whatever. I have a question, no? because every node actually contains the whole blockchain, eh? Yes. But the blockchain.
contract, each contract can already be two to the power two point two five six. So how large does every term needs to be to be part of this network? Um, you have whatever you need. So if, if you would use one, you, you have one. You don't need the entire network. <coughs> but if you have to use two to the power whatever, you would have to pay fees for that. So if I have it, you have it as well. So everyone no. needs to have it because otherwise you can't have consensus over it. So these fees, they will be adjusted. So they're not fixed. So, so this, this base fee that was used in this contract, maybe it's 1,000 uh, Zabo right now, but it will be adjusted over time. So if somebody really starts spamming the blockchain network and, and these, these miners start to complain, they can just decide themselves to increase the fee and then they will only take contracts that, that are willing to pay that fee. So I think there will be more like a market mechanism to solve a lot of these possible attacks. And people won't be actually storing all their kitty pictures and, and movies and whatever on the blockchain itself. Maybe only references and hashes and proof of, of storage. But the actual storage will probably be too expensive to store it on. There's no, there's no incentive. I mean, why would I store a kitty picture within the blockchain? I mean, it could only cost me money. So there's no, well, it doesn't make sense. Something anonymous somewhere on the internet. I'm sorry? If you want to have it in an anonymous place. But then if you are willing to pay for it, you yeah, can do it. it. Yeah, sure. <laughs> no problem. But if, if you don't pay for it anymore, does it mean it disappears? If you, if you, well, you pay for it initially in order to store it somewhere. So you store the kitty picture in the blockchain, but, that's uh, fine. Can the blockchain also uh, shrink? Uh, shrink? Um, it it technically can, because um, you can destroy a contract. Yeah, so there's a suicide clause in a contract. I think the, I, I, I knew when, when the if, you, if you trigger the suicide clause, you provide an address, it will basically delete all its own storage, it will get some of the fees back that were reserved when you were taking up these bytes, and all the money, including with the balance of the contract itself, will be sent to this exit address. So maybe at some point you just say, well, just nuke this, this, this thing and everything will be, will, be, uh, will be removed. So there is an incentive to destroy contracts. It doesn't have to stay in there. If you want to get your money back, you just send it the suicide command, whatever it's going to be, and you get your money back. But you can only do this if the contract itself has built this in right yeah. up front. So you can inspect yourself. So maybe there will be some kind of suicide contract via a scanner by Norton, which will look for self-suicide. No, that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> for, for, for funny contracts that have all these kind of triggers in there that you might not uh, suspect. So this is actually one of my biggest worries for this technology. And it's quite amazing. Oh yeah, absolutely. It is. It is a. It is a, a problem. problem. Yeah, it's a long-term problem. Um, you have to think that um, memory or storage is going to increase over the next upcoming years tremendously. Um, at least that's what we're hoping for. And even more obviously. Yeah, I think that's too easy to say. Like, um, let's assume that the laws, uh, laws law goes faster. And storage it, goes well, you faster. have you have to understand that for everything that you store, you have to pay. So if you're willing to pay for it, then fine, then, you know, you store it on my computer. But it's a one-time fee, though. It is a one-time fee. Could, they could, they could like, send, like, massive amounts of data. Yeah, but why do you, why do you, I mean, it's like throwing money to the network and say, like, oh, well, here, my money for my kitty pictures. No, they can fuck up the network again. Like, uh, so you they can also do the Bitcoin. Can fuck it's it the same with Bitcoin, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. sure. so, what's interesting, so it's a problem, but it's a problem not only with the Ethereum has or Bitcoin has. No. All these yeah. blockchain-based this digital currencies have this problem. And <coughs> if there's a solution, it, it can probably be shared and implemented on, on all these networks. So it's a major point of research, but it will be very interesting. Yeah, you, you have to understand. If you, if you have a, a solution for this problem, then you know just come to us. I mean, it, it's not, <laughs> it, it, it is not that we decide what's gonna happen. It is, a, it is an, like an open source community. If you, if you have anything to contribute, then contribute. That's how it is. Uh, I heard about uh, pruning. Pruning. You can you can prune as in, um, for example, all the spent outputs. That, uh, it, it doesn't have it doesn't have in and output, so you can prune in and outputs. But what you what you technically could do if you want to have if you want to remove all your own transactions that happened in the past, you could you could ditch them, but you would never be able to replace them. That is a problem on its own. 
So yeah, you can prove if you want to. Oh yeah, sure. Because I get confused by you saying it has no input and output. I thought right. transactions were input and output. No, I'm I'm sorry. I mean, as in in and outputs, as in the how how Bitcoin works. Okay. Um, so what Bitcoin you, works with a with a token mechanism that I own a token. My private key owns a token, and I can I can split it. And I'm not sure entirely how it works, but you can like split. Um, I say like I, I give my output to you and. And it gets distributed among the network. Yeah. But is it fair for my understanding that to, to have in my head that the transaction in the Ethereum? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That is of the contract right. So what? I I make a I make a I make a transaction, and it says I give you twenty either to your address, which comes from my address. Mm -hmm. And if if someone presses it, it looks like it looks at the the sender. It says like, okay, you're the I mean I'm the sender. It subtracts 20 from mine and it adds 20 to you. That's how it works. I understand, but am I correct in understanding that then a contract all if uh, transactions comes in, that triggers a contract to run its code, right? Yeah. And it could also send out transactions. Oh yeah, right? totally. And then it would use... And in addition to that, it can also update its own storage. So that's another... I so these are like two outputs I and two, two inputs. It is fair just for yeah. simplicity to think about it yeah. as the inputs and the outputs yeah. in the internal state yeah. that update. Yeah, more or less. Okay, thank you. So if you want to work with a lot of data, um, you can't just send them at, pass them as arguments all the time because then you have to pay like transaction fees for the transactions, yeah. right? It's yeah. the same as Bitcoin. Right. So you can build mechanisms where depending if the if your ether is cheaper than storage. Oh no, because it's always in ether. It is always. So you can't argue. Are uh, all contracts always transparent for everybody? Oh yeah, absolutely. So if you would store something within a network, everyone can see it. So there's a, as transparent as this is. Yeah. So maybe you can do some kind of code obfuscation on top of it, but there will then be an incentive for smart decompilation and, and, and reverse engineering of contracts. So there will be this reverse engineering contract lawyers out there. Really, really, really <laughs> <interesting. laughs> some sort of encryption between you and me. And but we are not sure how we are gonna handle that. So it is it is still you know up for debate. So, so it could be that you would introduce IP layer. Oh yeah absolutely. Yeah sure. Um, we were I was I was looking at for uh, Gavin the C plus programmer he was looking at um, uh, session based communication and then encryption between you and me. So yeah sure where Parties have to be in the Ethereum ecosystem, or does it interface with other privileges? What do you mean, within the Ethereum? Well, if, if I want to use it uh, to, to, to do something with you, you have to be an Ethereum user as well. We all have to be kind of signed up in the way. So, probably there will be gateways, right? So, the, right. there might be a party that is inspecting the weather, or based on the results of a contract, it might update the the, the, the New York stock ticker and display the latest Ethereum subcontract values. So if you're not running Ethereum node or Ethereum client yourself, there, are, there will be gateways to, to this. And of course, these gateways are somewhat centralized, but on the other hand, everybody could, could run such a, such a gateway. So there's also talk of running like Bitcoin on top of Ethereum because it's a Turing complete language. So in theory, you could run entire Bitcoin on top of it. Uh, I yet have to see the, the, the code for it. Can, can you tell a little, do you know a little bit about these kind of? How you can run Bitcoin on top of Ethereum? No, I don't know. Okay. No, <laughs> there's gonna, there's gonna be a whole bunch of code. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you can, can come up with it just yeah. like that. So, 
if I understand correctly, one of the possibilities would be to uh, get an uh, Amazon or otherwise cloud-based uh, program, um, which could be open source and uh, provide a hash uh, to show it's secure, um, and then publish things to Ethereum by running an Ethereum client in the cloud. So, so there is this, this research on, uh, I think it's called Secure Oracles, mm -hmm. where you can have a, a proven secure virtual machine in an untrustworthy environment, and you can inspect that the outcome of, of execution on that platform was, was properly done. Exactly. Uh, I'd say read the white paper and be the first one to implement it, but there's a, lo there's a lot of research on it. This is very exciting. And a lot of these things, a lot of this stuff was really theoretic until Bitcoin and until all these currencies came up. And so now all these, Crypto researchers are coming out of the woodworks, and now they really have a use case for all their for all their cool research. So a lot of cool things will happen. But yeah, so yeah. That's, that's why we that's why we started the, the cryptocurrency um, research group. Where, where is it? This is the crypto. Where is it? Where is it? Yeah. And, and it's all over the world. Oh, uh, oh it's not like some. No, 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 it's, it's not central. <laughs> okay. I mean, if you want to participate, fine. Do it. Yes, we do it here. Yeah. Yeah. Can you give your best estimate of what timeline you think uh, it will take to show it, it's really usable? I mean, there's a lot of a lot of promise, but there's also a lot of hope. And hope I know, I know, it, I know a date, but I don't think I can. <laughs> but do you have to think in months or years? Or, or oh, not years, not years, not years. years okay. Yeah. I mean, if, if you want to run a node, then fine by me. I mean, you can run a node if you want to. I understand that. I'm Probably on the drive. I'm just curious to what you are um, about. A couple of months. A couple probably, of months. Probably, yeah. Okay, thanks. <laughs> a couple of months. I guess the more we all participate, the faster we go. Exactly. Yeah. Probably, yeah. Fetch is welcome. That sounds oh, cool. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah? So at this point, after you run. So, so what you actually what you actually can do is uh, once you uh, let me see if I have a screenshot for that. So if you submit a transaction, so you you if you want to basically launch a contract into the world, right. you specify an empty recipient. So the two field of the transaction is just empty. That just means now I'm going to create a contract. Um, you can give it a, like a starting capital, like uh, now uh, go off to your own and, uh, and uh, be uh, well, do whatever, whatever you want. And then as the data, you would actually put in the bytecodes of the contract itself. And even, I mean, I don't know about the Go client, but for the C++ client, I think you can just even copy paste the, the Lisp-like language in here. And then on the right hand side, it will compile it to the, to the bytecodes. And then you just click on the, on the, send, on the send button. You have to pay the minimum fee to create a contract, and after that point, it will end up in the blockchain. Once it is mined, you can see it in the contract list, and the contract is out there, out of your control. Okay, and that's in the C++. Plan. That's already there, and it's okay. is it in the Go client? There is no there is no Lisp-like language in the in the Go client. There's just ASM, and that's it. You have to deal with it. Okay. So, but if we compile it down, then we can. Oh yeah, sure. Yeah, you can just copy and paste it with this uh, with this compiler. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So there's no way to do random, except for no, the guy. No, no, there's no random because, you know, uh, you if, need if, to be yeah, yeah. So if you want to do randomness, what you actually can do, you can use the the hash value of the block yeah. itself for the transaction. And that is pseudo random enough, non, well, you cannot influence it. Probably you cannot influence it up front. So you can use that as a random seat within your contract to do your uh, Satoshi dice, uh, uh, yeah, vit vitali Vitalik dice, or whatever, <laughs> on top of uh, on top of Ethereum. Yeah, you could use the nonce, for example, as a as like a, a random token, because the nonce is going to be random anyway. Yeah, exactly. You could also have the service submitting to a contract some other random number. Yeah. The contract yeah. 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 All right. Thank you very much. Let's have another beer. Yeah. Uh -huh.